Good morning. And good morning to you, Staunton. Uh, good morning to those watching on our iCampus today also. Uh, open your Bibles with me to 1 John. Not John, John, but 1 John. Same guy, a different book. Right? 1 John is toward the end of the Bible, back by, back by Revelation. 1 John. We'll be in chapter 1, chapter 2 today a little bit. Um, just so the, it's clear, right? Uh, in the bulletin, you got ready to see this morning. One of the first things up there, uh, it'll say that we're, our countdown is going. We're 70 days. It's 70 days from now till we're actually in the new building in Carlinville, okay? Um, that's going to happen, okay? We're no longer like, is it going to happen? Is it not going to happen? I don't know. It's going to happen. The question is, how smoothly it's going to happen, okay? And the question is, is um, how much pressure is going to be on us? And the question is, um, how, much, how much will be done? You know, like there's things that, need, that, that should be done that won't happen, but we can be in the building, okay? Like, like right now, there are no doors in the sanctuary, all right, so which is not a big deal. You just go from the lobby into the thing without opening the door. It's not a big problem, right? But I'm just saying there's, there'll be unfinished things. Obviously, the front end won't be done. I mean, a lot of things won't be done. There's lots and lots of things won't be done. Um, going to the new building, you know, we'll have our, we'll have our um, you know, unless something happens significantly, very quickly, you know, we'll have our old sound system. We'll have everything. We just have to, we'll piece what we can together and make it all work out. Um, but we're going to be in. So, just so we understand, it's not like, a, I hope this makes it. In the last week, we're going to say, ah, doggone, we didn't make it. We're going to make it, okay? So what I need you to do is, in Carnival campus particularly, Stanton campus, you want to help us out, we'd love to have your help, is on beginning of March 15th, and that's kind of our, because you say, well, that's, that's still a couple weeks out. Well, yeah, that's a couple weeks from the day we get in, but that's a big building. I don't know if you know that or not, but it's a big building, right? We got to clean that thing. Right? I mean, all the walls got to be wiped down. All the carpets got to be vacuumed or the floors got to be mopped. Whatever the thing is, we got to clean that building up and get it ready. On the 29th, it's the last Sunday we're in this building. The problem is we use everything in this building. Right? So as it sets today, the chairs that you're sitting in will be over there on April the 5th. Right? So we don't have new chairs. We just have the chairs we have, which is fine. We'll, be, we'll survive. Um, but what that means is, is that after church on the 29th, Right? We haven't set a time yet and whatever. We'll probably everybody go home, get some lunch. We'll set a date, like, you know, we'll set a time like a couple hours later or whatever it is, you know, because you first service people are different than the second service people, you know what I'm saying? But anyway, so we'll have a time frame in there somehow. And we will, when church is over on Sunday afternoon, at some point in time that afternoon, this will be an all hands on deck. Even if you're standing around looking silly, I'd rather have you here. We're going to move everything in this building to the other building. So even if it's just sitting there in the lobby for a while, at least it's over there, not over here. Is everybody tracking with me? Okay, obviously chairs, we know where they go to, right? There are some things like nursery equipment, we know where it goes to. There's some things we know where it goes to. Other things be like, I don't know where that goes. Just sit there for a second. We'll deal with it later. But we want to get this building emptied over there. So March the 29th, that's a Sunday. Um, Brady Weldon will preach that morning for us. And then uh, when we're done with church that day, we're going to be moving stuff. And I got some guys with some trailers. We'll get some trailers, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, I got one person already volunteered a trailer. Hey, Ryan, uh, can I get you some trailers that day, maybe? Anyway, I got some other trailers coming, too. So anyway, so <laughs> we're going to have some trailers that day. So we're going to haul things over, right, so we can use your help. Everybody cool with that? All right, so mark that day off. It, it'd be a really bad day if we don't get her done because that week's going to really be hard. <sighs> okay. All right. John, chapter uh, 1. Today what we're talking about, we're still in our series called, uh, called Shine, and uh, today is we all reflect something. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him, talking about Jesus, and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. Now, in my Bible, you might want to mark this, that, that's, that's John quoting Jesus in John chapter 8, not 1 John, in John chapter 8, verse 12, okay? Jesus says to them in John chapter 8, verse 12, he says, I am the light of the world. He's talking to his disciples, right? He says, I am the light of the world. Anyone who is in me, there is no darkness because they have light. And so they have light. What's that mean? 
It's like he's not a light. You know, when he says, I am the light of the world, and then he says, they have light. Well, what is that? That's the Holy Spirit. See, he began his ministry. The Holy Spirit comes upon him. He is 100% God, 100% man. He laid down his deity, right? He is living as a man. He is empowered by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit as a man, going back to Luke chapter 3. Then he, he is living his life. He says, I am the light of the world. He is declaring, I am the Messiah. I am the one light. Because at that moment, he's the only one who is empowered by the Spirit of God. Holy Spirit living on the outside of others, on the inside of him. He says, anyone who lives in me, there is no darkness. Anyone who walks in me, there is no darkness. Because he has light. In other words, the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit who empowered Jesus, lives in them. So that's John chapter 8, verse 12. So it goes with that passage there. Verse 6. If we claim, and this is getting pretty serious now. If we claim to have fellowship with him, the him is always Jesus here, right? If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. Now, let me kind of spend some time there for a second. That phrase, walk in darkness, does not mean you made a bad decision or that you sinned in some way. Any one of us on any given day can sin. Making a choice to sin does not make us unsaved. You cannot lose your salvation. That is not a biblical concept. Now, we've talked about this. I don't get too far into it today for just time's sake, but you cannot lose your salvation. But again, let's remember, praying prayer, does that, bab- does that save you? Okay, I've got one no out of that. Okay, praying prayers, does that save you? Absolutely not. Okay, does getting baptized save you? Now, you may have been taught that, Right? I'm not debating that you were taught that as a child or you know, the church you may have used to go to may have said that to you. I'm not debating any of that kind of stuff. I, I know churches of all denominations, of all flavors, they'll say all kinds of silly stuff, in my opinion, silly. Right? And they'll want you to get baptized so that you can be saved. Well, if baptism doesn't save you, then what's the point? Other than a statistics to count. And I'm not saying they don't even believe that. I'm just saying that biblically speaking, if you study your Bible, the Bible is the sole, S-O-L-E, authority for how we choose to live and what we choose to believe. Anything extra than the Bible is gonna be wrong. It's not my interpretation of the Bible that is true, it is scripture that is true. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes, okay. I mean, you can like what I have to say, but if what I have to say is not in keeping with what the scripture says, there's a problem with that. And sometimes, I'm gonna do a series after, starting after Easter, it's called Paradox. I'm gonna talk about some of those kind of like things like that. Like there's a, the Bible seems to say different things or whatever it may be, what is that and what's it mean? So we'll talk about some of those issues, but don't ever be afraid of coming to scripture and look for truth, ever. Well, that wasn't what I was taught growing up. I don't care. There's lots of things I found in the Bible that wasn't what I was taught or is different than what I saw. There's a lot of things, that's okay, and that's okay. Here's what it says, is that if we, that, that phrase that says walk in darkness, it doesn't mean if you sin once, okay, you're in trouble. You sin, you know, five times, you're in trouble. It's habitually if you're walking in darkness. So here's who it applies to. It applies to people who say they're saved and habitually, routinely, walk in darkness, not in light. I'm not thinking about any situation, right? So if this, if this applies to you, I'm not trying to make it apply to you. I'm just telling you what I think I need to say because I didn't plan on saying this. But um, sometimes you have the mom that their kid is going plumb stupid, right? And um, they want to believe the kid is saved because they came forward or they prayed a prayer when they were seven years old in vacation Bible school. And the mom holds on to the promise that if you're saved, once you're saved, you're always saved. I need you to hear me. And this applies to all of our relationships. Just I'm, thinking, I'm giving that one example is you need to apply it to yourself or hope the Holy Spirit helps you see those relationships. 
Here's what the Bible, I'm, just, I'm reading to you out of scripture, right? Here's what it says. That if we claim to have relationship with Christ, yet we habitually walk in darkness, we are liars. The truth's not in us. Now that's what it says. Now, salvation is based on God's grace. All that kind of stuff, I'm not gonna debate that with you. It says walk in darkness, it means they come to church, I'm not talking about works, I'm not talking about any of that kind of stuff. Don't get weird on me, just hear me. See, we need to be broken hearted. We need to allow the spirit of God to break us over the spiritual condition of ourselves, of our family, of our friends, of the communities we live in. Because there's lots of people who want to claim salvation the moment they die, but they don't live anything like that during the course of their lifetime. Baptism doesn't save you. Prayers don't save you. Church attendance doesn't save you. Giving money does not save you. Volunteering does not save you. Being a pastor of a church does not save you. Being a life group pastor does not save you. Being the greatest whatever in the world it is that you are does not save you. Salvation is based on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the only way that you know that you are saved is if you see the activity of the Holy Spirit in your life and if you do not see the activity of the Holy Spirit in your life, you are not saved. Now, I don't know how long it habitually is, right? I mean, you get in a funk and you go stupid for three days. Does that make it habitually? No, whatever. You know what I'm saying? I don't know what, her, I don't know what the timeline is. Like, well, what do you mean they're walking in darkness? Like, for one day, are they done? No. Was it one week? Is it one month? Is it one? I don't know what habitually means. I just know that what it says, that when it says walk in darkness, it's talking about habitually. That's the, the Greek word doesn't mean they made a mistake or they sinned once. It means that they habitually are walking in a, in a position or in a lifestyle that is not in keeping with Scripture. That's what it means. There are people who we want to believe are saved who are not saved. They need Jesus, and we got to stop acting like it's no big deal. We gotta stop being, we gotta start being broken hearted and we gotta start praying with a little tears. I mean, when was the last time you prayed with tears? If you never pray with tears, then you're missing something. I don't mean tears in, my life is so bad, please help me. But tears is in compassion and brokenness over the state of whatever it is you're praying about. That if you don't pray with tears, then you, got, you ain't seeing the world right. You're not seeing what the enemy is doing to families and to people and to teenagers and to individuals. And you don't see the people living without hope. You don't, you don't see the people walking around with blinders. There are people who go to church and they've got blinders on the whole time. I mean, it's like, it's easy to get caught up in, I go to a good church. And miss that in the midst of being a good church, we are planted in a place that is broken and hurting and dark. If you go back to, I mean, I would have completed my 15th year here in uh, the first Sunday in March. I guess the last Sunday in February would be my actual completion. But if you go back to my first messages 15 years ago, I would say, that what God wants to do in this church is not gonna happen from this stage. It's gonna happen in and through you. We're at that place. This is not a come watch the Tim show. We can't get done that way. This is us being light where God has planted us. This is us being the hands and feet of Jesus where we walk on a given day. This is us praying down the barriers and the strongholds and the spiritual warfare. If you picture like a dark storm, okay? Picture like this really, you know how sometimes you, it's like two o'clock in the afternoon, but the clouds are so dark and black that it's like it's, it's nighttime. It's just, it's just gloomy. You turn your lights on to dry because it's so dark. But right above the clouds, you know there's this beautiful sun that's shining, right? Picture that kind of environment, except those clouds, that's what spiritual, that's what spiritual warfare looks like. It's like, a, it's like a, a dome of darkness over the place that you live. Macoupin County has a dome of darkness over it. 
Now, just on the other side of that spiritual warfare is where the light shines. Instead of seeing, instead of being S U N, it's S O N. And our job is to live a life that helps break that darkness, to pray prayers, to walk into spiritual warfare in a way that, that cracks and breaks through that darkness so the light of the Son of God can shine into the darkness. Because when the light of God shines, which is Jesus, people are drawn to him. Anyway, different message. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. Verse seven. But if we walk in light as he is in the light, if we walk as he is walking, how's that? The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit was empowering Jesus. The Holy Spirit's empowering us. Jesus was who he was in the scripture. Now, he is the son of God. Don't misunderstand me. But he laid that down according to scripture and took up equality, with, you know, with, with, he took up the, the, the human likeness and laid down his equality with, with God, and that, that's how he chose to live, right? Jesus is shining because of the Spirit of God in him. He is walking the way we're supposed to walk. It's the Spirit of God living in and through us. Um, verse 7 again. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, uh, his son, God's son, purifies us from all sin. So there's two points of walking in the light. One point is, is that we have fellowship with one another. Now, fellowship with one another, here's the best way I can describe this. Uh, churches who have conflict, okay, and that kind of stuff going on, that is the absence of the Holy Spirit. You, you can't sidestep that. You can't debate that. That's just the way it is, all right? That individuals who are always trying, there's always drama, there's always contention, there's always stress. The Holy Spirit wants to bring unity, not sameness. I call the word I use, is, the phrase I use is harmonic unity. We can be different and all get along. See, the point is, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to me and working in me and the Holy Spirit is working and speaking in you, then we'll all be okay. But the problem is, is that words like pride get in the way. Words like ego get in the way. Our woundedness gets in the way. Our insecurities get in the way. Our, oh, I just need to be, somebody needs to validate me and tell me I'm okay. What, what, if what you're doing is wrong, what are you supposed to say? You, you see what I'm saying? It's like, well, I just need to need to need to need to need. Okay, if you need to need to need to need, what about the people who you're supposed to be giving and giving and giving? Sometimes we don't make that transition from I'm the one who needs and then I'm the one who gives. You know, we, you know uh, the, com the consumer mindset that a lot of people have about church. They're supposed to keep me comfortable, make me happy, meet all my needs, take care of my kids, take care of my teenagers, take care of my whatever, and then I'll come and, you know, and their jobs take care of stuff. I don't want to give money. I don't want to give time. I don't want to volunteer. I raise these kids all week long. Why do I want to volunteer in children's ministry? <laughs> That's crazy. All of a sudden, we, we, it's easy to have a consumer mindset. We want our opinion to be heard. That's not necessarily biblical. Are you tracking? And what happens so many times is that we just kind of forget our position. The Holy Spirit, and, those are, and that's always our flesh. There's this constant war that's raising between the Spirit of God, if, if you're saved, if you're not saved, it's not true. If you know Christ, your Savior. There's the Spirit of God living in you, and there is your flesh. And they're waging war. It's just constantly. I mean, I'm just, it never goes away. It's, you, you don't outgrow it someday. It just, it's always there. Maybe some days it's a little easier, and some days it's a little harder, but it never goes away. You're constantly in a battle. Constantly. Last Sunday, I, I, don't know if it's, I don't know which service it was, but maybe in both, I don't know. But I made a comment last Sunday about, maybe it was two Sundays ago, I don't know. I made a comment about how we don't do things for attention. Or we don't do things to get, you know, um, to get credit for it or whatever it is, right? And whatever those things are. It, but, you, you know, it doesn't mean that when you do something, you don't have that whisper in your head like, they didn't even say thank you. 
So you can be the most perfect Christian of all time. You do something selflessly, right? You don't want any kind of attaboy for it. You don't want any kind of pat on the back for it. You don't want any kind of affirmation for it. And then you walk away. It doesn't mean that you don't have that thought that says, they didn't even say thank you. I don't care who you are. That's normal. But then what do you do with that? I didn't do it for the thank you. I mean, they didn't say thank you because they're too busy. Maybe they didn't think say thank you because they forgot about it. Maybe they didn't say thank you because they haven't run into me yet. It, that, but that's not why I did it anyway. See, I don't care what it is we do, there's always gonna be a level of warfare with our flesh. That it's hard to follow where God wants us to go and, and it's just hard, it's, it's not natural. What's natural for a follower of Christ is not natural for our flesh. Does that make sense? What's natural for the follower of Christ is not natural for who we are as our flesh, our normal person. It's hard. What we do as a follower of Christ, that's normal for a follower of Christ, is not normal for the communities and the culture we live in. It's abnormal for those things. And so what John's saying in that first passage I read to you is, is that how you know you're saved is you walk in light, not in darkness. If you're habitually walking in darkness, you're not saved. That's just the flat answer. But if you are no Christ your Savior, if you do walk in him, then you're going to see the light, and it's going to give us, the word there is it's, it's going to like, uh, give us fellowship with one another. It's going to connect us. The Spirit of God, it's like you picture cherry pie, right? And if the feeling is, I mean, good cherry pie, when you cut it, there's a, there's a cut on the crust, but there's not really a cut inside. Because where the knife cuts, it goes to back together. You know what I'm saying? Right? The cherry pie that's like really stiff and rigid is not good cherry pie. Everybody tracking so far? Okay, now, so you cut the cherry pie and it all comes together. Okay, so the idea is, is that we may be individual pieces, but the Spirit of God makes us one. There's unity. There's a sense of we're on the same page. We have the same Father. We're on the same mission. We may approach it different. We have different spiritual gifts or, or the things we like and dislike and the things that we're natural about. And not, those may look differently, but the same Spirit is in all of us and working in all of us and empowering all of us and transforming all of us, and we're on the same path, the same mission together. And you know that's true. That thing that makes us want to be opposite with each other, that thing that makes you want to get your, your nose out of joint over some kind of issue, that is never going to be the Holy Spirit. That's always going to be your flesh. We say, well, what is it when it's a real issue we need to address? You can address real issues and not get yourself all worked up in your flesh. Because when you do it, it's the Holy Spirit. You can speak the truth in love. You can shoot straight. You can be honest and be kind. You can receive well when somebody tells you something you don't want to hear. Because see, what makes you want to react when somebody tells you something you don't want to hear? That's your flesh. Who do they are? Tell me something. Because even if they're wrong, ready? Even if they're wrong, it's your flesh that gets worked up, not your Holy Spirit. I'm going to say it to you again. Even if the person who's correcting you or challenging you or pushing your buttons, even if they are 100% wrong and you are 100% right, the Holy Spirit living inside of you is not upset. It's your flesh. So when they push your buttons or when they get you worked up, just understand. That just demonstrates that there's an area of your flesh that you need to let God work in still. So the things the Holy Spirit gets worked up about is the condition of our heart and our apathy and the brokenness of our community we live in and the fact that we don't give a rip. The fact that we live our day every day so concerned with our lives that we didn't think about inviting someone to come to church with us this week. Or that we tried to blend in the culture so much this week that we didn't stand out and shine like a star in the universe. Or that we got our nose out of joint and we know the truth, but we went ahead and said it anyway. We've been hearing about not grumbling, but we went ahead and grumbled anyway. We've been hearing about not complaining, but we went ahead and complained anyway. We knew we shouldn't do it, but we did it anyway. 
Jesus did not get upset with sinners. Who did he get upset with? Religious people. People who claim to know the truth and didn't live it. Who do you think Jesus is going to get upset with in the culture we live in today? He, I hire him on staff. He comes in. He's Jesus, right? Who's Jesus going to get upset with in our church and our communities? The lost person on the street? <laughs> no. He's going to be upset with me. He's going to be upset with you. He, he's going to be upset with the things inside of us and are the way they're supposed to be. He's not going to be upset with the lost people. You know why? Because they're lost. They don't know him. The Spirit of God doesn't live inside of them. He's going to be upset with the me and the you who has the Holy Spirit living inside of us and we don't let him transform us. He's going to be upset with the, the you's and the I's that, that we, we have the, when I was raised in Kentucky, we said you's. I almost said that. That's funny. You know, it's like when I moved to Illinois, I moved to Illinois in sixth grade. And where I grew up, we don't call girls guys. You know, but in Illinois, it's like, you guys, you guys want to come over for pizza? And that, that you guys applies to girls and boys. You know what I'm saying? They don't do that in other states, just in case you didn't know that. And so, but anyway, but you guys sounds better than you-ins. And, and, and the real country people call it urines. <laughs> Are urines going to come over for pizza? You know, I kind of said, anyway, it's a different ball game. So I'll just stick with, you know, we, y'all's okay. You-ins and urines is not okay. Y'all's okay and guys is okay. We'll let that work out. Anyway. So the, the person the Holy Spirit's going to be upset with is not the, the person who doesn't know Christ who's pushing my buttons. The person who God's going to be upset with is me. Because if the Spirit of God lives inside of me, he knows what should be happening. He knows there'll be transformation. He's not going to be upset that they're doing something bad. He's going to be upset that I'm not doing the good that I know I should do. You know the Bible says that, right? That if we know the good we should do and don't do it because it's called sin. So that person doing something really bad in our mind, oh, that's horrible, I can't believe they're doing that. And the person who's not doing the good, God wants you to attend life groups. You don't want to. It's called sin. How can attending life group be called, not attending life group be called sin? If God's stirring your heart to attend life group and you don't want to do it, it's called sin. Well, you, know, you didn't invite somebody to come to church with you this week, and well, how can that be sin? Well, the Bible says that if God stirs your heart to do something, you know the good you ought to do, and you choose not to do it, it's called sin. Jesus, if Jesus was here, if Jesus was physically in your life, right? So track with me. If Jesus was physically in your life, he would physically call you out on the things about you that weren't in keeping with his nature and his character. Everybody tracking so far? He's not physically here. Like, yes, he's not physically here. He's here in the person of the Holy Spirit. And if you know Christ, your Savior, he lives inside of you. The Spirit of God lives in you. He is physically living in you, and he's still calling you out. God is not worried about the lostness of mankind. Pause that. As much as he is about those who claim to know him and don't live like it. Because if those of us who claim to knew it live like it, know him, live like it, then we would reach the lostness of mankind. Number one in the outline, <clears throat> shining is reflecting light, not generating light. Shining is reflecting light, not generating light. I don't have to do things for God. I don't need to do anything to impress you or I don't have to do any of that stuff. I don't have to generate any light. What I'm called to do is to reflect it. Now here's the reaction or here's the reality. All of us reflect something. That's just, you know, so let's say that I'm, let's say you see me in my pain. You see me being insecure. You see me being fearful. You see me being worried. You see me being stressed out. You see me being angry. You see me being in my flesh in some form, right? What is that? I'm reflecting something. I'm reflecting my woundedness. I'm reflecting my pain. I'm reflecting my insecurity. I'm, refle I'm, re I'm reflecting something. We all reflect something. Why wouldn't we want to reflect the light? It's like if Jesus was the sun, the sun is bright, the moon is bright. But the moon is only bright because it's a reflection of the sun. Is that right? Is that, is that correct? We're only bright because of the reflection of Jesus. We're not bright because of ourselves. It's God is the, he is the light. I am the light. I am the light. 
If you walk in me, there will be no darkness in you because there is light. And you have light. Then we are to reflect that. Wherever we go, whatever's going on, good day, bad day, religious thing, non-religious thing, hanging out at work, hanging out at church, hanging out at the ball game, nothing really matters. We are a reflection of something all the time. We just decide what we want to reflect. That I want to reflect Jesus, and I want to reflect my pain. That I want to reflect Jesus, and I want to reflect my offense. That I want to reflect Jesus, and I want to reflect my excuses. I've said a thousand times over the years that I don't do what I do for me. And this is one of the transition we have to make as individuals, and maybe you have, maybe you haven't made it yet. At some point in time, you stop living, you know, it's like pain, life's not so painful anymore, and you stop living that God can get you out of your pain. You have to stop, start living for other people. It's not just, my life is such a mess, if God can just fix it, it goes from that to, my life's okay. But there are people who's watching, and I need to live a life that reflects the only way they're gonna find hope, the only way they're gonna find truth, the only way they're gonna find light. Number two in the outline, shining connects us. I've already talked about that, shining connects us. Shining's not me creating the light, shining's my reflection of that. But if you're reflecting the same light, it's gonna connect us. We'll be one. The unity of our church, I get that a lot. You know, people are just shocked about how our church has endured and how our church has persevered and all the things that God's doing in our church and, and how we get through all these things and, you know, the buildings and all those kind of things and over all the years and litigation, all the things that have happened in our life. But it's like, how do you guys get through all that? I mean, that would destroy most churches. Well, it, the absence of the Holy Spirit, you're exactly right. But it's the presence of the Holy Spirit that connects us. There's a difference. And um, we can't take credit for that. I, as a pastor, I, I don't ever say to my friend who asked that question to me, well, it's my divine, amazing leadership that does that. I never say that stuff. You know, it's like, I don't know, just God. You know, it's just God working in people and people choosing to follow him instead of other stuff. That's how it's supposed to be. If you're, if you're somebody who you don't know a stranger and you meet them and they actually walk in the Holy Spirit, you should know that. It's called the witness of the Spirit. That's what it's called. You, you, you'll, you'll feel it. You will know, hey, we're on the same page. There are people that I am, I'll say family with, that I know that I am family with them. You know Why? It's because of the Holy Spirit. Not because I like them or don't like them. Not because we like the same things or don't like the same things. It's I know when you're, with, when you're with people that are walking or doing their best to walk in the Spirit of God or whatever you want to call that, they're in, you, you know. You just know. And that contention thing, sometimes you're around people like, I, I'm trying to like them, but man, it's just always an edge. It doesn't mean you don't, mean you don't like somebody. It just means there's just always something that that's not God. There's always an edge there. There's, there's people that you, just, you know, you just, we're family. And there's people that's like, I'm working it like you, but man, you just, that's where unconditional love comes in. Right? Number three, we can't fake shine. We can't fake the shine. There used to be a thing back in the 80s, they used to use that phrase, fake it till you make it. You know? And that got a lot of people in debt. You know, they spent a lot of money and got bought a lot of stuff and faking like they had a lot of money, hoping they'd get a lot of money someday, you know, and things like that, fake it till you make it. That doesn't work in real life and neither does it work in your spiritual life. You cannot fake the shine. You can fake it short term. You get into church service and you, I, I know people who are really demonstrative in their praise or they really, can pray really beautiful prayers. I mean, some of the most beautiful prayers I've ever heard prayed were prayed by people who did not know Christ their Savior. Some of the sneakiest people I've ever met, they, knew, they, they claimed to know Christ and they manipulated people. They, they didn't know Christ. 
But boy, they could sure play a good game. But you can't fake it. If you know Christ your Savior, you have a sense. And those people will eventually show themselves. It eventually comes out that there's something's not right. Or their motives are wrong. Or they're driven by their ego. Or things like that, whatever the case may be. I mean, there are pastors that can grow a church because they're competitive. I mean, I guess one of the things that I talk about here sometimes where I, I don't come to your houses and, you know, you visited once and we hit you, you know, five times and promise you something if you come to our church and beg you. We don't bug you. We don't, we don't try to get you to come to our church. If God wants to draw you, that'd be great. But we go the opposite direction, maybe too far the opposite direction, Right? There are some of you who need to be baptized, and we don't make a big deal about baptism as far as like, you know, because a lot of times churches count baptisms as a way of, of getting numbers and statistics. They feel better about themselves. And, and, and we probably, in the area of statistics and things like that, we probably go too far the other direction, okay, because I'm just weird that way, right? But the reality is, is that sometimes you do things that are right for all the wrong motives and all the wrong reasons. Eventually it comes out, though. You can't fake that for long. It's going to come out. Uh, look at me real fast while we're here. First John chapter two. Here's what this says. Verse chapter two. We know, this is verse three, chapter three, verse three. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. So it's a similar thing to what we've read in chapter one. Okay, similar, a little different. One's about light, one's about obedience. Same thing, same basic thing. Is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. There's lots of people who do the right things for wrong reasons. You got, are they even saved? I don't know. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in him. Okay, you see that? If we obey the word, then the love of God is made complete in them. God continues the transformation process and they become a good reflection of Jesus. That's what that means. Now, so think about this. They pray prayers, but they don't obey God. They, they might be saved. Let's just say they are saved. I don't know. I, I'm, I, don't, I don't know. I'm not going to debate that. I don't know. Let's say they are saved. But they don't follow, they don't obey God. The truth of God, the, the, the light of God, the, the work of God is not, the love of God, using this passage, is not being made complete in them. So they can be 35 years old, say I got saved in their seven. Maybe they did. I don't know. But then all of a sudden there's, there's nothing being true in them. There's no transformation taking place in them. Let's say they got saved at seven or whenever they got saved and they're 35 years old. They've been in church the entire time. You can be in church the entire time and be lost as goose of the hailstorm. You know, you have no clue. I go to church, but I'm not being transformed. If I'm not being transformed, so if you right now are not being transformed, this passage, I mean, you're not saved, but this passage applies. The reason you're not being transformed is you're not choosing to obey. Where's the area that God's saying, obey me yet? You could be saved and you just locked up someplace. Well, I'm not gonna do that. You made some vow to yourself. You made some vow to your friend. You made, you made some statement, something became a stronghold in your life. I will never do whatever it is you said you'd never do. And by golly, you're not going to. And Satan has beat you up with that for years in some cases. The only way you find transformation is through the process of obedience. It's not a prayer. Okay, God, if you'll just fix this in me, Nay, how she works, honey. You can pray all you want to. And there are things that God will do for you, but most things God will do in you and through you, not for you. Are you tracking? It's I have to make a choice to do that. I have to make a choice to step into that. I have to make a choice to own that. I have to make a choice to obey that. When I make my choice, then as I make my choice to surrender to God and obey God, then he goes into action. Not that he goes into action and make me want to do it. Because remember how we started this passage or this, this uh, series? It's God, this is Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. Verse 13 says that it's God who works in you to both want to do and to do his good pleasure or his purpose. See, God's already working in me to want to do it. That's the promise from Scripture from day one. I'm the one who says, I don't feel comfortable. No, I'm not going to do that. I'll look weird. I'll be rejected. I don't know. I don't, I'm not going to do that. I can't afford that. I'm not going to respond to that. God's already wanting me to do it. He's already going to be working in me to do it. I have to grieve and quench the Holy Spirit to say no, to disobey him. And some of us have disobeyed God so much, that has become our normal. Our normal is walking in disobedience. 
I mean, let's say that you say to your child, take out the trash, and your child says no. And you're upset by that as a parent. Okay, take out the trash, child says nope. Take out the trash, child says no. And let's just say you rain down some kind of discipline on them to make them take out the trash. Right? They take out the trash, and at some point, let's just say you get tired of the battle. I mean, you just, you don't even, I'm, I'm tired of fighting the battle. I'm not going to take out the trash anymore. Did your child become obedient? No. You just stopped asking. Tracking? So let's say God says, Tim, take out the trash. Whatever that thing is. Nah, I don't want to. Or, I, oh, sure, I'll do that. I'll get to it later. And I never get to it. Right? There's a place where God just keeps, stops asking. I look like I'm walking in obedience. I look good, man. I'm not doing anything wrong. <clears throat> Only because God stopped asking. God not asking, God not stirring your heart is not a compliment. The parent who doesn't ask the child to take out the trash anymore because they don't want to deal with the child's attitude, that's not a compliment toward the child. Is that correct? That's a, I'm sick and tired of your attitude. I'm not going to put up with you anymore. I'm just going to ignore you. I'm not going to ask you to do something and deal with your stuff. When God does us exactly the same way, it's not a compliment. It's God just saying, you know what? I'm tired of messing with you. I'm looking for someone else who, I, who, who will obey me. I'm not going to waste my time and energy on you or your church or your situation if you don't really care. Because there are people... In the I'm looking throughout the entire earth, 2 Chronicles chapter, seven, chapter 16, verse 9. I'm looking throughout the entire earth through people whose hearts are fully devoted to me so I can strengthen them. And over here, the person who don't want to take out the trash, God, please strengthen me. God, please give me. God's not paying attention to that. Why not? They won't do what he asked them to do. There's the other person who's more than happy. They will obey. But God hears that prayer. Well, no, God hears all our prayers equal. No, he doesn't. Don't find that. You can't find that in the Bible someplace. We're not going to be equal in heaven. That's not in the Bible. There'll be people who get there with rewards, and there'll be people who get there just barely as if by fire, it says. They got there because of God's faith, because they, not because they earned anything. Verse five, but the one who obeys his word, the love of God, is truly made complete in him. Right? And you, you see how that, is the word, is God's love being made complete in you? I mean, are you walking, I mean, if you just get, I'm giving you ways to process that. I mean, I'm jumping to verse six, verse six. Well, I, didn't, I never did read the very first part, last part of verse seven, or verse five, I mean. This is how we know we are in him. That word know, is, there's two words in the Bible for the word know, and this is the word that means to know through experience, not know in your head, to know through experience. How do you know? I talk, the way I use the phrase here is I'll say that the only way you know you're saved is the activity of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's how you know you're saved, right? That's the word know right here. This is how you know that you're in him. Verse six, whoever claims to live in him, in Jesus, must live as Jesus lived. You can't fake the shine. Whoever claims to live in him, in Jesus, must live or must walk as he walked. How's that mean? Wearing a robe and sandals? No, that's cultural. Having long hair? Nope, that was cultural. Being single? Nope. What's it mean? What's he mean? He has to live as he lived. Being in full-time ministry? Nope. What it means is is that he was controlled, he was led by the Spirit of God. He lived his life empowered by the Holy Spirit, allowing the Holy Spirit to do immeasurably more than he could ask or imagine in him. It's really allowing God to do immeasurably more than you could ask or imagine through the Holy Spirit in him, through what it was. So if I claim to know him, the expectation isn't that I came to church most of the Sundays that month. The expectation isn't that I gave a few dollars that month. 
If I claim to know him, the expectation is that I'm being transformed by him, by the working of the Holy Spirit in my life. That I stop making excuses and I recognize that the, my excuses I'm making, that's what irritates him. That's what he's gonna come after. If I claim to know him, but yet I don't live in him, I, I'm the one he's gonna be upset with. I'm the one, I mean, read the words of Jesus. Read the hostile things he said to people who claimed a religion but didn't have a relationship. Jesus, I mean, even with his own disciples, his own disciples, he said, how much longer I got to put up with you people? I mean, he's basically saying, let's get this crucifixion thing over with. He said, these guys are killing me. He was frustrated. What do you think he is with me when I just keep jacking around? When I say I want to see him do something, but I don't want him to do it through me. When I say I want to see him respond, but I don't want him to do it to me. And number five, or number four, excuse me, the last one I've been talking about all the time, is that shining is normal and natural for a follower of Christ. Shining is normal and natural for a follower of Christ. Shining is normal and natural for a follower of Christ, as opposed to being culturally normal or normal than our culture. You gotta make a decision. Do you want to reflect your culture? Or do you want to reflect Jesus? It doesn't mean that your marriage gets easy, but I'll make a promise to you. Two people in a marriage reflecting Jesus are going to get along a lot better than either one reflecting Jesus and the other one not, or neither one doing that. Your parenting. I mean, just as a child, as a parent, if both people in that relationship are reflecting Jesus, we're gonna get along a lot better than when our flesh is in the way. In your relationships with your friends, in the ways we see God work in our communities, in the intensity of our prayers and the level of our worship, in our areas of obedience, in areas of surrender, in areas of giving, and you know, in areas of volunteering, in area, pick the area, pick the topic. I don't care what we're picking, pick anything you want to pick. If I am a reflection of Jesus instead of a reflection of me, if every time I see my reflection coming up, if I try to I crucify that, I try to not suppress it, but I uh, I, I choose to surrender it. There's gonna be a different version of Tim than if what you get is Tim and Tim's flesh. And then when somebody says something, somebody does something, just because someone can spout off don't mean you should give them rights to control your emotions. Just so when someone can hurt you doesn't mean you should give them right to control your attitude. It's not weakness. It's strength that it takes to stand when the storm around you wages and you have peace. It takes strength to stand when the person is pushing your buttons and it tries to cause pain in you and your woundedness is coming up or your insecurities are coming up. Your doubt is coming up and you choose to to follow God anyway. That's a sign of strength, not weakness. Anyone can react, because remember I tell you before, every time I get my emotions worked up, we call it anger, whatever that is, it's always a defense mechanism. Anytime you get yourself upset, it's always a defense mechanism. It takes strength to stand in the midst of the storm and not go into your flesh. Here's what helped me. I am a reflection of something 24 seven. I'd rather reflect Jesus than my pain. I'd rather reflect Jesus than my hurt. I'd rather reflect Jesus than my excuses. Because my pain and my hurt and my excuses haven't helped anyone ever. 
But Jesus, he is hope. He's life. He's light. And he's what people need to see. May my prayers, may your prayers reflect Jesus. May your worship reflect Jesus. May the way we choose to live our life be a reflection of Jesus in the place that he planted us in. Let's pray. Dear Father, you, uh, your light never goes out. It never goes dim. It never goes dark. God, I'm so sorry for the things that get in the way of my light. For the excuses or the pain or the distractions or the sin. For some of us, it's even in the midst of a church service and a moment of worship. We can't even shine here. If we can't shine in here, we all have no chance outside. I pray you speak to us. I pray we respond in a way that honors you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.